It is said that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Unbeknownst to us, the journey began before we ever knew it had. We thought we were interviewing deep thinkers for a film about our culture. Kind of on the outside looking in. We didn't realize we were on the inside looking out, and that the journey would soon change us. By the time that we realized that it would, it was too late to turn back. It seems so irrelevant to go and ask people what does what is postmodernism, and it's a weird conversation starter, that's for certain. But it's a question that I I know the significance of it because as I started to explore it, my life was changed by exploring the question. You know, people say today is a different world than it was 30 years ago, and for the most part, they're right. We do think about things differently. And of course, to be able to explore that, you got to be able to answer the question. What is postmodernism? Postmodernism? Hmm. Postmodernism? You really think about that? No, not really. I don't know. <laughs> not really. A trick question. <laughs> Isn't post usually what comes after? That is a tough question. Well, according to Billy Corgan, um, postmodernism is whatever the f*** you want it to be. The first difficulty in defining postmodernism is that everybody gets a crack at it. Well, postmodernism is what we have after modernism is over. Modernism is really the worldview you associate with the rise of modern science. People believed in progress. The role of human reason. Or the idea that reason will eventually be able to give us every answer to all ills. In fact, it exalted reason to such a degree that it tended to put faith second. Now, that's last century. In the 21st century, all of those kinds of modern thought have become old-fashioned. If you think of modernism as symbolized by Tower of Babel trying to reach up and replace God, postmodernism is the Babel that came after that when people lost the ability to communicate um, because there's no common language or presuppositions. We didn't wake up this morning and go, wow, look, <laughs> the world has changed. It's not just been like a political change or a social economic change. It's more fundamentally profound than that. It's what if the very way that we think has changed? You find a little
Having said that, I don't really think it's possible to define postmodernism. Let me define postmodernism. Let me give it a go. And of course, there are many different ways of defining it. It's an attitude towards truth claims. A kind of suspicion of all absolute truth claims. Truth claims are not what, they're, what they seem to be. In fact, truth claims are attempts to control other people. That's one way of defining postmodernity. A recent French philosopher, Jean-Francois Léotard, defined postmodernism as incredulity towards all meta-narratives. An incredulity toward meta-narratives. That's a mouthful, but basically what it means is a kind of skeptical attitude towards all claims of absolute truth. Meta-narratives. Now the actual word he uses in French really translates into English as big stories. There are all kinds of big stories. One kind of big story might be human beings, by way of human reason, are capable of knowing everything. Another big story is that by way of modern medicine, we are able to cure all ills. Those are just some big stories. Postmodern would say there are many, many different stories. Other people might talk about it in terms of the uh, rejection of, of any one narrative, any one story. The fact that it is postmodern after a particular period suggests that it's, it's still open to interpretation and still yet, yet to be defined in many respects. You don't know if it is an actual period or transition to another period. Postmodernism or postmodernity is all over the map. So you have all sorts of people who believe quite disparate things calling themselves postmoderns. So you get fragmentation, uh, people pulled in different directions, even the same person pulled in different directions. Maybe there is no way we can find any kind of objective truth. There isn't really anyone who is sort of able, certainly I'm not, to stand up and say, I am the arbiter of what postmodernism is. Postmodernism is a kind of bastard offshoot of modernism. It, it's an illegitimate child that is constantly trying to kill its, its parents, but in one sense it's, it still partakes of the same problem, uh, namely the elevation of the individual and of the subgroup to the point where it is impossible for anybody to listen to God. Standing here in this fog, it's just... Uh, it reflects how I feel about what's going on in church today, that there's a fog and we can't see things clearly. The scary part of it for me is, is this sense that nobody else realizes we're in a fog. If you're born blind, do you even know you're blind? If you're born in the fog, do you even realize that you're in the fog? Growing up in the fog of Christendom, how can we know what clear vision would even look like? You can't understand postmodernism without understanding what modernism is or was. Pre-modern culture, whether Western or otherwise, always realized that religious questions were the center of social life and social activity, and that they had to be answered first, and then we answered other questions. A key definer of modernism in the early modern period is Descartes. He and thinkers like Isaac Newton um, thought that reason was sufficient to get us at absolute truth. The great philosopher Immanuel Kant, who lived back in the 18th century, proposed that the most important thing in ethical decision making was that the individual for himself become convinced of what is right and wrong. You know, following like, by my morals, I'm not hurting anybody. We should do good and then we will be rewarded, but I don't believe in punishment. I just need that we, we, we need to learn from our mistakes. Immanuel Kant called that autonomy, self-determination, deciding for yourself what right and wrong is all about. Kant thought that all people, if they were simply thinking rationally, would come to see the world exactly alike. Now it's hard to imagine how he could have thought that, except for the fact that, as it turns out, Kant never went farther than about 15 miles from his house, from his birthplace, in his entire life. Towards the end of the 19th century, the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, who of course is very famous for his saying that God is dead, and his explicit um, denial of any absolute moral truth. I think he would be a good example here, who takes this modern idea of the self being on its own 
to its absolute extreme. Because Nietzsche, among other things, uh, did not believe that morality was a good thing. Nietzsche realized that, in fact, um, if people were arguing a worldview without God, there was no transcendent basis for these ethical values. It was really a house built on sand. There are people like, for instance, Nietzsche. And his proposal that we make up our own values, that we invent uh, our own tablets of virtue. Because Nietzsche thinks that one ought to think on one's own, and he sort of glorifies the self in the way he thinks. Nietzsche's argument goes like this. If there is morality, and we think that we can provide a kind of foundation for morality, then aren't we, in effect, God? Uh, that's what sets the scene for the 20th century, where we find um, just a completion of this degeneration from this tremendous confidence in reason to discover absolute truth to finally where we are today, and that is a denial that there is such a thing as absolute truth precisely because reason was insufficient to get us there. Reason doesn't really guarantee consensus because you can start from lots of different foundations and you'll get to different conclusions all using reason. And so there came to be this loss of confidence in science as a grand narrative with all the answers. Modern science, as it develops, suggests to us that we can understand how to do a whole lot of things in the world without asking the religious questions. We don't need to ask that question anymore. We don't need to ask the why question. We only need to ask the how question. In the Enlightenment, in modernity, there is no place for faith. Especially if we're confronted with suffering or disasters of some kind, uh, uh, the why question may be unanswerable. I don't think it's too hard to argue that everyone ultimately makes certain kinds of beginnings that ultimately are grounded on what we would call faith. If we ask why did God allow this hurricane to kill uh, 2,000 people, we may not come up with a, an answer that's satisfactory. So over time, because of the fact that we got so good at answering the how question, we stopped asking uh, the why question. Whereas the modernist believes in absolute or universal truth and the sufficiency of reason to discover it for us, the postmodernist believes that reason is insufficient and there is no absolute truth. Both the modernist and the postmodernist have it half right. The modernist is correct in believing there's absolute truth and incorrect in thinking that reason is sufficient to get us there. The postmodernist is uh, correct in denying the sufficiency of reason but incorrect in drawing the conclusion that there is no absolute truth. When I look at what postmoderns crave, the word authentic comes to mind because people are tired of seeing the showiness of church. When people in today's culture seek this authentic relationship, seek realness with people, the church, I think, tends to be at a disadvantage because we have been seen as being hypocritical, as living double lives, as, oh, you do this on Sunday, and then you're this way the rest of the week. Because we do that. I was and, like, I just we're so, seen that way. That's so what we do. <laughs> when we look at trying to reach people, I think one of the first barriers to overcome is that that image that the world has of us. We're gonna put that aside and we're gonna help try to get it out of their minds. We're gonna become so real, we're gonna become so authentic to them. We're going to engage them in, in discussions that are meaningful. The answer to me is not how do I make my life outside the institutional church be more consistent with my life inside the institutional church. I go the other way. How do I make my life inside the institutional church be more consistent with my life outside the institutional church? Because it's outside the institutional church is where I touch those people. That's where they see me. And the, and the answer to that is kind of what's been driving me to withdraw from the institutional church because I can't fulfill those concerns inside the structure that the church demands of me now. You know, I've got non-believing friends that have never been inside a church and I suspect probably never will. I mean, it's just, it's not going to happen. They're not, they're not going to the church to look for an answer there. It's not going to happen. But they've got needs, like any of us do, but clearly even more so because they're of their non-belief. Their lives are already structured a certain way, which doesn't include church. So the way I reach them is to not go, hey, man, 
you need to come to church with me so we can sit down and listen to this stuff together. So I go, you know, why don't we get together on Sunday morning and sit on the back porch and talk about what's bugging you? Because instead of you with the need coming to me like I'm gonna fix that, how about if I actually come to you? And I'll go to you. Now the problem that creates is guess what? That I'm not I'm not in church on Sunday morning. So somebody's noting that. <laughs> church police. <laughs> point is, is that the difference about fixing that disparity between in the church and outside the church, I think to be true to ourselves and true to the scripture in fixing that is we have to realize that it's more important to go to the non-believer who's in need than it is to drag the non-believer who's in need into our right. circumstances. Right. Just the other day I was driving down the road and I passed this sign on a church that said, revival here every Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> and the world around us looks at it, and the people, the non-believers drive past that sign and they see this that says, Revival every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., and they say, what the heck is going on? Those people if are a bunch people, of nuts. If these people are being revived, why isn't there a difference in our community? Why isn't the, the neighborhood being changed? Why isn't this city being changed? Why isn't this, you know, this whole region being changed? So then, once again, they go, oh yeah, it's irrelevant. The church is irrelevant because they don't produce what they say they're producing. Traveling around the country, we could just come face to face with all kinds of different people. Some of them are college students, some of them are professors, philosophers, theologians. Some of them are really deep thinkers and others are not so deep. Some not, <laughs> yes. But two of them really stood out as we wrestled with this mess we call postmodernism. It's like, a long time ago, everybody's like, kept asking me, they're like, what are you searching for? And I was like, oh, I ain't searching for anything. I'm just traveling, you know, I'm doing this. And I finally like, why, why does anybody do what they do? They're searching for an answer why they're here. None of us really know. Like, you know, some people like, you know, they got the whole church thing, which is good, and they're like, you know, this is why I'm here and this is what I'm doing. But it's like, if you really sit back, you know, everybody's had that little voice in their head, like, why am I really here? What am I doing? So, like, I, you know, I have no idea. That's why I travel. Even if you do find the answer, I mean, yeah. how would you know when you found the answer? Yeah. I don't know. I ho like. I, I hope it's like you know a big ton of bricks and like you know this big epiphany. And I'm like, oh, but like you know, uh, it's like the immortal question: Why are we here? We do not know. I think you see the signs or symptoms of postmodernism everywhere you look if you have the eyes to see it. In the 1960s when we all saw the real rebellion and the tremendous change in almost every direction of life. People will say, well, this is my choice. This is how I live. Biological changes from the use of the pill as a birth control device. In the arts, particularly in film, where uh, people who believe in absolute truth, pastors or uh, priests or clergy um, are often represented as uh, hypocrites. The legalization of abortion in 1973. And a general skepticism towards any absolute truth claims, a kind of moral apathy that uh, I find more and more prevalent um, among college-age kids who don't really take seriously the idea that there is some right way, some absolutely right way that they should be living their lives. All of these gave form to what Nietzsche basically had said, and what he had said is that there is no real sense of meaning, that each of us has to decide for ourselves what life is all about. We have to define right and wrong for ourselves. This is not something that has any objectivity. It is purely subjective. It's up to each of us to decide.
You know, everywhere that we've been, we've been able to see kind of this change in the way that people think. Right. So the way we think does make a difference, and our thoughts and ideas do have consequences. And our thinking impacts our behavior, and our behavior kind of defines the culture. And coming full circle, does our culture impact our thinking? And if so, perhaps more importantly, what are the consequences of our culture changing the way we think? Postmoderns crave the mystery. The fact that things could be mysterious about faith is beautiful. As a, as a believer growing up in the modern church and, and into this transition, I was always given the impression that as a believer, you need to have the answers. And so we kind of shaped God within this box. We knew every name of God given to him in the Bible and we made posters about him. We took every attribute of God we could find that he has revealed to us and we put him into this box of who God is. And we could stand back and look at it and it makes us feel proud that we've got him in the box. And the postmodern comes along and says, to hell with your box. The, the postmodern wants not to have everything nice and neatly packaged this way, but the fact that there could be loose ends, the fact that there could be questions remaining at the end of the day, that we could put our head on the pillow and not have all the solutions. That's comforting, I think, to the postmodern. Things that would never have been discussed, uh, much less indulged in in our culture, the things that we formerly would have been ashamed of, which would have to be called deviant. We parade now and we're quite proud of. People will say, well, this is my choice. This is how I live. You can't tell me to live differently because I am the ultimate authority. I make decisions on what I like, what I desire, and what I will. So we talk about sexual preference, which is uh, just a remarkable term. Uh, a friend of mine once commented that it would be like saying, uh, that people who uh, stole for a living had a different acquisitional preference. Very frequently, the one thing you're not allowed to say anymore is that somebody's wrong. You're not even allowed to be corrected by the Bible. It all depends on your interpretation. Right, you can't tell me that this is wrong. I've decided that this is okay for me by my lights, and no one can tell me differently. One quality of postmodern people today is to compartmentalize their lives and compartmentalize their minds. And so it's very often to have someone who has a religious compartment. And, and maybe it's very solid and orthodox and biblical and they believe in Jesus and they believe in the Bible. And yet in another compartment of their lives, they hold beliefs that are totally contradictory to that. Nowadays, the biblical literacy is so profound. And I think as a result, there's a generation of young people who don't know anything about the Christian story. The people that I evangelize in university campuses nowadays don't know the Bible as two testaments. They've never heard of King David. If they've heard of Moses, they confuse it with Charlton Heston. We've been so zealous to make sure that Christianity doesn't somehow get shoved down people's throat. And the schools have interpreted that as um, a legal prohibition against teaching Christianity. And we've ended up sacrificing our cultural heritage. Christianity is the the embarrassing family secret of Western culture that we have to keep locked up in the closet. We don't want anybody to have to face our Christian heritage. There was a recent uh, article in the Atlantic Monthly, a very shrewd analysis by, by a, a cultural anthropologist who's, who's very good at making soundings. He interviewed a whole lot of students at Princeton University. Now, of course, Princeton University, you know, they're, they're, it's a pretty elite bunch. What he discovered is that there's a new generation coming along that is driven, driven now toward excellence after all, driven now toward succeeding, toward thinking clearly, toward doing good work, uh, workaholics uh, and so on. What he found nevertheless was that they are morally empty. I think the best explanation is that the person doesn't really take morality seriously, they're just playing the part, usually for some sort of social or political gain. There's no moral code. And in one sense, their very excellence is not pushing toward a high enough goal. There's no drive for personal improvement. And I fall down in love. And I, and I fall down, fall down in love. 
If there is no absolute truth, no overarching story, no meta narrative, <laughs> no big story, what is there to give meaning to your life? What is there to give meaning to anything? I guess I just don't understand why someone would reject the concept of absolute truth, especially without thinking through the consequences. Maybe because of our fallen intellect, we can never know the truth fully, but truth exists. It's, it's objective, it's, it's transcendent, it's an absolute. The law of non-contradiction, uh, basic principle in logic, which says that no contradiction can be true, that's an absolute, because to try to deny it is to affirm it. You know, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, these are absolute, objective, moral principles that transcend the culture, transcend the individual. Because they transcend our culture, we can even criticize our culture when it falls short morally, or when, there's, when the, you're in an unjust or oppressive society. The law of identity, which says a thing is what it is, that's a logical uh, absolute. The old... Uh, thinkers uh, said that there were three kinds of things that are absolute. Uh, the true, the good, and the beautiful. I guess my truth is what I feel I know. Truth is what you believe, right? There's absolute truth for me. For society as a whole, that's hard to say. One of the problems with modern society is relativism. Postmodernism tries to take away all the rules. We create our own truth. We have allowed things to be, well, you have an opinion, I have an opinion, everybody has an opinion. But I wouldn't say my truth is somebody else's. I mean, what may be good for me may not be good for the next person. And what may be bad for me might be good for him. One answer is just as good as another. If you think that, you are much less likely to search for truth. Because in fact, if, if it's all relative, why bother? I mean, of course, there's right and wrong, but to a certain extent, there it really is no right and wrong. It's just what everybody thinks. What makes something right or wrong is whether or not there is a choice. I definitely think that there are absolutes. Um, I think it, that we need to be more humble in our approach to trying to find them. For the theologians, all of the absolutes point to God. Whoa. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, um, you go. Uh, no, where does God fit into all of this? Well, God is the one who is truly absolute. He is the source of all truth because he created the universe. He's the source of all that we know that is, is good. Uh, if you take the Ten Commandments, I think they state truths. A lot of what were previously seen as absolutes are really just um, aspects of, of, of our culture. If moral imperatives always grow out of a particular cultural framework, then who's to say what is the right thing to do? I'm a scientist and uh, I believe heavily in absolutes. I don't think there's a lot of relativism at all. But there also are certainly relativistic truths and they're not inconsistent. I don't think there's absolute truths. I think there are eternal verities or truths. Absolute truth, that's a, it's like an oxymoron. I think that there are eternal truths. I don't claim to know them. Uh, that may be part of the problem. We may disagree on what they are. Postmodernists see truth as an individual construction, that we each choose what we want to believe. Everything can be debated. If um, values are really relative, we shouldn't argue about ethics at all, because there, there cannot be a basis for argument if there's no truth. I think that the worst thing about postmodernism is the tendency to exalt relativism, the sort of thing that Socrates was fighting in ancient Greece, which is the idea that whatever I think is, is right is right for me and what you think is right for you. And as Socrates saw, society cannot stand that. Society cannot live on the basis of relativism. There has to be some sort of shared values, some, some shared commitments about what's right and wrong. If people agree in a certain area, then that's everybody's absolute truth or a community's absolute truth. I think we're not sure just how relativistic we want to be because at the same time that we're very relativistic about personal morality, particularly sexual morality, 
people are, are more insistent than ever that it's immoral to eat meat or to wear furs. So people form their moral beliefs based on what they like, on what gives them pleasure. What's happened with postmodernism is this common statement, there are no absolutes. Well, we're sitting in a cemetery. We're surrounded by people who reached the end of their lives and died, which is what human beings do. When you are dead, there will be no arguing your life or death. Now, the postmodern thinker would say that there are no absolute truths. It's like an oxymoron. It will not be up to you to decide if, you, if the truth is relevant or if you want to accept it or if you think it's appropriate or not. You're dead. Well, you have an opinion, I have an opinion. So, in a sense, we have some kind of an absolute truth around us, which is that human beings get old and die. We can't argue that. There's no negotiating. I don't think there's absolute truth. You almost have to say, come here and stand and look around and, and see that there is an absolute truth. And yet we still have this postmodern thought process that wants to say, but truth is relative and that we don't have to accept that there are absolute truths. Well, if nothing else, it's this. This is not an option. You will be here. I think so. That's why I believe in reincarnation. I, I don't think it should be punished or rewarded. I think you should be reincarnated as many times as you need to be to be rewarded. Every choice you make in life, you have in, to pay a certain life. consequence. I think you'll have, you won't really learn it directly. I think you'll have certain instincts. Today, the question, what is truth, seems to imply that there is no truth, period. Perhaps the first thing we have to say when we start talking about truth is to ask a question. What kind of theory of truth do we want? It's not a question of which truth, which philosophers may have asked in the past, but now it's more a question of, is there any such thing as truth, period? And of course, the assumption is, no, there isn't. Everybody has to make up their own truth. Everybody has to create their own virtual reality. If we're looking for a theory of truth, what kind of theory of truth do we want? Well, if you think about it a moment, you realize the answer is, we want a true theory of truth. Now, that's a bit of a problem, because if we want a true theory of truth, but we don't know what truth is yet, then, in effect, we've presupposed what truth is in order to find it. And so a lot of the postmodernists are saying that truth is a construction. It's not a discovery. It's not that there's some objective realm out there that then we learn about to be true, which is the way people looked at truth for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Postmodernism says the truth claims have to be taken with a grain of salt. But I'm often surprised by how we as human beings think that we should be able to define truth as if somehow we, with our puny little reason, should be able to make sense of what truth is. And these are beyond ourselves. They're transcendent. You know, they're mathematical truths. They're philosophical truths. They're theological truths. That at the end of the day, as they say, there's got to be a truth to be had. And I think that's, uh, that's a point where postmodernism will tend to disagree. They don't want to ever talk about a truth or the truth or a primary truth, because any t attempt to do that as far as they're concerned, it's an attempt to privilege the authoritative and the powerful people and to uh, subjugate the minority. We as human beings have some inkling of what truth looks like. And so all our attempts to define truth begin with that inkling. And I take it that, as a Christian, that inkling is something that is given to us by God. Postmodernism proves what Christians have been saying for hundreds of years that without God, there really will be no basis for, for truth, or for reason, or logic, or for order in the universe, or anything else. It is the very nature of truth that it is what it is independently of what anybody says. So, even before anybody knew that the Earth was round, or relatively round, that, it was, that it's floating in space and orbiting a certain star in our solar system, it was still the case that the Earth was round and was orbiting the Sun. Whether or not anybody believes it, in a way, is incidental. 
the insight of the postmodernist is, is that there are many perspectives, but what postmodernists tend to miss is to claim that there are all these perspectives is to make a truth claim. People tend, and maybe more accurately I should say, we tend to think that the values we hold or don't hold, and, then the, and the things we believe, and the things that we don't well, believe, sure, but we act as if it won't impact other people, but in reality, they do. I've heard it said that the philosophy of one century becomes the common sense of the next. It's the story of your eyes, the greed of love, the alibis of life. You say you give yourself away. It's the story of our lives, and it's better without compromise. Come on, let's together give ourselves away. Let's together give ourselves away. Let's together give ourselves away. To me, it's always just a shame that my neighbors, my physical neighbors, watch me drive off to go to church for the third time this week while I don't even know their names and I ignore them. And that's just an unbelievable phenomenon that takes place in our culture today that we cannot even know our neighbors and yet we're commanded to love them as ourselves. I think the balance of, of the scales within the, the local body is often on the equipping versus the serving. The serving part of it, the loving your neighbor, which is one, you know, one of the main ways we show love to our neighbors is by, be, by serving them, by becoming servants to them. And so if it's out of balance where the focus is on our own uh, spiritual growth, it's, you know, what I, say, what I see is turn your back on yourself, forget about your own spiritual growth. Start to focus on loving your neighbors yourself. Pull this back into balance. And in the process, guess what's going to grow? You grow. We, we don't abandon ourselves to the act of loving our neighbor. When you do put the concerns of your neighbor ahead of your own, the wall we run up against there is, I'd love to help, but I can't because I have this obligation at church, or we have to go to Sunday school, or there's something coming up that I can't be with you right now and and quite yeah. frankly if you miss church or uh, an elder meeting or something else you were obligated for for the sake of serving your neighbor the believers would hold that against you because you weren't taking care of them <laughs> the reason why we help people is not based in our own desires the reason that we help people or serve people is because if Christ were here he would do the exact same thing. He would help. He would serve. I remember talking to a young student, an undergraduate at Cambridge University a few years ago, and he came up to me after one of the talks and said, um, I want to ask you why you should be pushing your worldview over against mine. I said, well, tell me more about your worldview. He said, well, I, I really am a, a, a committed postmodernist. I, I do think that we create our own frames of reference, our own moral systems, our own truth structures. I, I really do think that. And I said, how do you go about the question of defining right and wrong? Do you have categories for right and wrong? He said, to be honest, I think that's one of the hardest questions for, for postmodernists to address. I, I don't like to think about questions dealing with evil because at the end of the day I don't really see how an intelligent postmodernist can address questions of evil really convincingly and seriously. I said to him, do you hear what you've just said? He said, what do you mean? I said, we've just come through the bloodiest century in world history. We have managed to bump off about a million and a half Armenians, about six million Jews, about 20 million Ukrainians, about a third of the population of Cambodia, close to 50 million Chinese, plus whatever we're doing now in tribal squabbles in Africa, and on and on and on. Not fewer than 100 million people butchered, apart from war and disease, not to mention rape or corruption, and you don't have a category for evil. And then you have the audacity to ask me how my worldview is better. 
So many people today, even if they don't watch Oprah, still have been infused with the Oprah worldview that everything is lovely and everything is uh, wonderful and everything is acceptable except intolerance. And on their own reckoning, who's to say that postmodernism is right? That's merely one more philosophy that is itself uh, making totalizing claims. Every cultural artifact has exactly the same truth, significance, or value as every other cultural artifact. I would want to say that's cultural nonsense. Is Hitler's perspective exactly the same as Mother Teresa's in terms of value? Does it all depend on your point of view? And there are some people who actually argue that. At the end of the day, you can't actually say Hitler was wrong. He was merely wrong from another point of view. And, and I would want to say that there is something profoundly bankrupt about that sort of stance. What I want to argue with my young Cambridge friend is precisely that Christians can make sense of the evil of the 20th century and the evil that will take place in the 21st century in a way that postmodernists can't. But it also has a solution for that evil. But what happens with the next generation? Even the students who are in college now, when they grow up, will they even remember what those moral values were? It's, uh, it's going to be a very intriguing time to see what happens when the group of people who've been reared on postmodernism then become our surgeons and our bankers and our accountants and our uh, police officers and our judges. But what will happen when, they're, uh, when it's a generation of people will come into those positions for whom a postmodern perspective is just how they have always thought? The problem is you cannot go back. Right, there's no rewind button. And if we can't go back, we can't live as if the world around us has not changed. Well, if that's the challenge, then the question is how do we find a way to go forward from here? It's ingrained in us that you don't do something if it's just for one person. You do it on a big scale. You got mass distribution. You don't buy one, you buy bulk. You buy so much that you're not you're gonna be able to throw away the extra. Making a difference in one person's life is not good enough. So the, the gospel of Christ was not a a global gospel in the sense that he came and broadcast it to everybody. And what if we asked for less in our church? instead of asking for more. Didn't he have the power to stand on the Temple Mount and stretch out his arms and say, all the people of this planet be healed? Clearly he did, but he didn't do that. What if we said less ministry? What if we said less discipleship programs? What if we said less worship? His ministry of healing was, was focused with single individuals. If we lay down that American mindset of the super size me mentality and say let's do less but in doing less let's do it better maybe I can reach one person and reach them really well it's not about getting as much of the gospel as you can to as many people as you can it's about changing the lives of single individuals by ministering to them in their lives where they are right now. And not be trying to be broadcast over the airwaves, but truly have some kind of an impact on one person. That's where the change is. No one has the right to impose their views on anyone else. Everyone has a seat at the table. Everybody has their say. You need to be very tolerant. Who are we to judge? Even beliefs and lifestyles become like a, a visit to the shopping mall. What kind of beliefs would you like? I can be a Christian and believe in reincarnation. Wait a minute, there's a contradiction there because Hebrews talks about you die once and then judgment. There is no reincarnation. Oh well, but I like Christianity to some degree and I like reincarnation. Reincarnation's cool, why can't I have both? And now we've kind of brought that metaphor down to the point where we think that our lifestyle can be like that, contradictions don't matter, and our beliefs can be like that. We can put together a nice big 
buffet of things that we like. I think it's the culture that has still trained them, almost brainwashed them, to think that they have to somehow make room for every other point of view as equally legitimate. We need to make sure that, that if people who've been excluded all get a seat at the table. Everybody has their say. And then you wonder, uh, does this extend to conservative, Bible-believing Christianity? And the answer is often no. People keep saying that this is a more tolerant age. In, in fact, it's redefined tolerance and in some ways has become less tolerant. As much as a postmodern world emphasizes various perspectives, various stories, various narratives, it's still not found a whole lot of room for, for people of, uh, of faith. Under the older definition of tolerance, um, you were tolerant if you held to certain strong views but insisted that those who disagreed with you um, have every right to, to articulate their views. Nowadays, the new view of tolerance says that you must not hold that any views are right or wrong. Any attempt to persuade someone is taken as a personal attack. We were able to combine a great level of at least professional tolerance as we profess tolerance uh, to, to a very great degree, and we're able to combine that with intolerance of anyone who doesn't agree with us. And, and, and now with each one thinking that he or she is at the center of the universe, if our interests clash, then, then there have got to be fences, or war, or rape, or pillage. All, all, all because each of us is saying, I will be God. If you go all the way back to, to Genesis, we see that what happened is that the original order was God, other, self. And the inverted sinful order is to put self first, other second, and God is kind of a place of last uh, resort. That expresses the rebellion. So instead of us trying to conform to the image of God, uh, we want God to conform to the image of what we think life ought to be about. And so God can be a Republican or a Democrat, God can be a materialist, whatever. At the heart of all sin is this self-love that dethrones God, it de-gods God, and, and makes me the center of the universe. God, if God says, oh, I don't give a rip, they can do whatever they want, then he is, he, he is denying his own significance, his own significance as God. That's why the Bible can speak of the wrath of God. It's, it's not bad-tempered whimsy. It's his principled, holy response to the sheer, audacious defiance of people made in his image, made by him and for him, who now shake their puny fists in, in his face and, and sing with Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Where's God fit into all this? Um, I'm not really absolutely sure because like, you know, I, I, I don't really believe in like an organized religion and I still believe there's like something out there, you know, controlling us. Don't know what it is, you know, I don't want to put a like, you know, specific name on it. I'm, you know, I'm following like, by my morals, I'm not hurting anybody and I realize there's something up there, and, you know, there's a reason I'm here, I just don't know it. Like, that's as far as I can go into like that answer because that's what I think. Do you have any read on it? Where's God get into this? Um, yeah, talk. I think religion is sort of like a more evolved form of government. I don't believe in it that way. I believe in we should do good and that we will be rewarded. But I don't believe in punishment. I just need that we 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 need to learn from our mistakes, not get punished for them. As part of my journey, I found myself in China. And there, the word is that the Christian church is just growing like mad. And they have no traditional worship services. They have no church buildings. They have no hymnals or parking lots or any of the trappings that we have. So what does that kind of experience do to you? Well, it definitely made me question my role in the traditional church back here, and it made me ask the question, is the church broken? Oh, Jesus, won't you hold me? Wrap me up and keep me warm all through the night. Gently whisper while I sleep that you're here. G
I don't have to go to church and be bored. No. I have a strong, strong faith. So, strong faith. So what makes the church not relevant? What makes it that you that you that you need the faith? You admit you need the faith, right? I got the faith. And it's important. It's important, very important. It's but what you I don't never... need the structure. I don't need the thank you. I don't need the structure. Well, why because not, why the structure it... has broken down. When I talk to pastors, I don't I don't hear from them that the church is broken. We would say that, perhaps, and they would say things like um, the attendance in our services isn't the same, or we don't seem to be, have an effective outreach, or we, we're not really connecting to the community. Uh, they wouldn't see it as being as those being symptoms of the church itself being broken. A missionary friend that I visited over in Thailand, and he said, when I was in the States, I was a deacon, Sunday school teacher, I was doing all the right things. But what I realize now is that over here in Thailand, I live my faith out so very differently than I ever did in the States. And I don't want to go back and fall into those same habits and same routines. So the traditions that we've adopted have, have uh, created a, a, a way of doing church that isn't what God had in mind. I don't think that's the design for it, because I, I can't help myself but ask, is this what God meant? Because if it is, I'm really disappointed. I'm really disappointed in God, because this this does not represent the holy and mighty God that, that he has told us he is. So I, I've come to believe that that's not true, but I think that what we're seeing is not what God intended. One of the things that tells us that things are changing is when the practices that we've had that have been effective in the past stop being effective. So we did something in the past and it worked. And now we do the same thing today and it doesn't work. That's one of the things that tells us something has changed. Our journey has revealed that fundamentally the way people think has changed. In the past, people who were seeking truth might come to a church and so people could come going, I, I'm empty, my life is empty, I need some truth, I need to fill this with, with an understanding of truth. For in the church says, we don't have an offer much, we have this God that makes an offer who says, come to me and I will take care of you and give you everlasting life and so forth and so on. So the person goes, aha, there is some truth there. His heart's touched and moved by the Holy Spirit. The altar call is made, the person comes down the aisle. But today, you make an altar call and nobody comes. It's not that people don't respond to altar calls. But the people who used to come to the church seeking truth aren't there anymore. God listens to me. God knows I'm on his team. I don't have to go to church. People don't come to church seeking truth. Well, why is that? Well, part of the reason is our thinking about truth has changed. It was Ludwig Feuerbach who first really worked out this idea that the conception of God has always been a projection of human beings. We make up God because we need him. We, we need some kind of fatherly figure, someone that we can sort of trust. Lewis in The Problem of Pain talked about the grandfather God who lets everybody have a, have a nice time. Yeah, that's the God that no doubt we all want, but it isn't really God. If you grow up, say, in a Western culture, then chances are your image of God is going to be a function of uh, your society, your upbringing, say, your, your Christian heritage, your church. Now, of course, there it gets a little difficult. Rather than God being the orderer of all things as the maker. The postmodernist is going to say there is no objective single God who created all of reality, but it's all just a matter of your perception of God. We affirm as Christians that God does exist. And who actually wants us to be faithful and to go through hard times, to serve others, and yet to stick to it and be faithful to Him. Cannot decide if I 
heaven, hell, a truth will win the game. Wouldn't it be easier? Wouldn't it be easier if we gave it one more try? And choose away. It seems that each of us tends to create God in our own image. Well, they say that everybody, regardless of what they believe, they worship something. So if it's not God with a big G, it's God with a little G. Money or cars. No, power, fame. Sex. Self. What about the church? Ooh, uh, pastors, sanctuaries, the Bible. Jesus fish? It's on my wish list. What's going on? It seems that maybe the church is part of the problem here. Well, I'll go way out on a limb here, because hopefully this will be edited out. <laughs> what church is designed to do is to, to seduce believers into thinking that they're doing probably the greatest indictment of the church today is that we don't practice the gospel. You know, we preach it, we teach it, we do all kinds of things with it. We put it on banners, we sing songs about it. We just don't actually do it. We just go automatically to church every Sunday. Week after week, and do the same things over and over again. We will never observe what it is that's going on there, and mm -hmm. be able to, to do something different from. It. And then you have the danger of there's people that have a vested interest in making sure that we don't examine the traditions of the church, of the North American church, because you know we've created an institution that that you know. When I left the church that I was with, I'd been with the church for about uh, six or eight years. When I was asked one of, why I was leaving. I told the pastor, I said, I, I've, I'm having a problem with the church because it's not adequate, it's not sufficient for me to be a part of a church where the gospel is preached. I said, the, the desire of my heart is that, I, that I'm part of a church where the gospel is practiced. How do I live my life in a way that is consistent with what I believe? What does it mean for me to love my neighbor as myself? How do I take care of others? How do I live out my faith in a real and meaningful way? Something has got to give. I just can't keep living my life this way. Just basically to do good. Uh, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. And understand why I should be doing good. Well, I mean, it's my own personal view. And I don't want anyone else to be hurt. You know, I don't disagree or agree with it. It's not good or bad. It's just like one's over here and one's over here. We seem both to be doing good, so it doesn't matter. So you can believe in what you want to believe, and she can believe in what she wants to believe. In what degree, or what are you talking about? Like, direct me a little bit. Out. I have no idea. The bottom line, how do you know the difference between right and wrong? <laughs> like, moralistically. Like, as long as you don't hurt anybody else, you know, that's like, you know, you don't steal from anybody, and like, treat everybody as like, you know, as how you would anybody else, you know, don't do anybody wrong. If you stay in your space and do your own thing, then that's what, what should be cool. Well, you know, it kind of sucks. You just have to tolerate it and come on to compromise. You should compromise instead of conform. Morals of like killing or, you know, that, that's like, you know, I can't see any like compromise on that or anything like that. But, you know, just as like moral standards and like day-to-day -day life. Losing my family or a friend, that's, if it would hurt me, and if I put myself in the other person's shoes, then that's how I decided it was wrong. Bonhoeffer 
was leaving the church. The church had been taken over by the state under Hitler in Germany, under the Nazi regime. As he was leaving that, he was going to just start a whole new movement, basically. The people inside said, no, wait, why don't you stay? Because you could have influence inside the church. Well, sure. Stay here and, and help, and you could, you could be influential. And his response was, if you're on a train that's heading for the wrong destination, no matter how much you run back up the aisle the other way screaming, we're going the wrong way, you're still going to end up in the wrong destination. Is this something that is both as complex and yet as simple as Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door? You know, that it's just that it, it's just time for people to make a public declaration and take a stand and say, we're not going to do this anymore. That's kind of the point that I think a lot of people are right now. Um, as they look at their own uh, relationship with God and their relationship with the established church. We're not jumping off the train because we see that the things that the church is doing are bad. We're jumping off the train because we see that the things that the church is doing are distracting us from the things that Christ said we were supposed to do. How do we jump off the train? What is it that, what is that move? We don't need big buildings. We don't need fancy worship centers. We don't need carefully scripted and choreographed morning worship services. We don't need God help us anymore. Jesus is my girlfriend songs. Mm -hmm. We need, like David talks about in Psalms, some broken and contrite hearts that God can do something with and make a difference in the life of our next door neighbor. Jumping off of a train sounds like a serious solution. Sounds permanent. Well, it's, it's more than just jumping off a train. I mean, the jump is the scary part, but the real work starts when you hit the ground. Maybe it's more like crossing a bridge leaving a place where you're comfortable and going to a place that you've never been before. You know, the jumping from the train requires a huge commitment, but crossing the bridge to unknown territory requires you to be just as committed. In either case, we can't turn back. Do I believe in anything enough to get me to march from Selma to Montgomery? How much revolution does it take? Mm -hmm. And how visible is that to, yep. to change the direction that this runaway train is going? Is it going to take uh, someone nailing uh, new theses to the door somewhere? Is it going to take people marching in the streets? Is it going to take... Uh, is it going to take, you know, people being killed for the cause? How do we, as responsible Christians seeking to glorify God and to love Him and our neighbors, how do we produce the, those kind of turnover events, the ones that will become the milestones, without compromising our love for God, our love for our neighbor, you know, and, and the glory of God in the process?
are those events going to be <clears throat> within North American Christianity that are going to set the stage for this quote-unquote revolution? going to be violence no. because that's not what we want. And we're not saying that there's going to be civil disobedience because that's not what we want. But we are saying that the time for revolution is now. That we have reached a point that it is time to revolt and throw off the historical established understanding of the way we've been living our lives as believers and take on a new understanding that aligns itself with the scriptures and that truly lives out loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. That makes us a powerful place to be. Clearly our activity will be seen by some to be blasphemous mm -hmm. uh, because we're betraying, they, they, they make the mistake, if you will, of believing that it is the religion that is being betrayed mm -hmm. and that we are blaspheming uh, because we would not act to blaspheme God, clearly. Like Selma, Alabama in 1965, when the Civil Rights Movement came to a head, and people said, we are not going to be treated a certain way anymore to sit by while everybody else votes, and we can't. We demand the right to vote. And they marched across this bridge. You're saying that we've reached a point in Christianity, effectively, which says there are people out there who believe, like we've come to believe, that Christianity is missing the point. It's time for people to stand up and declare that a change has to be made, for people to stand up for what they believe in, and right. to make a declaration, this is it, like Martin Luther did at the dawn of the Reformation. When but I don't know if there's enough people that are ready to, to do that type of an action for what they believe in. So what does revolution mean? It could mean looking around you through a new set of lenses. It could mean abandoning old habits. It could mean living your faith in new ways. It could mean jumping from the train. It might mean nothing short of a rebellion of thought. We didn't know that in less than four hours, all these questions, all our discussions, all these possibilities would be meaningless for Kate. Well, how did you decide that killing was wrong? Losing my family or a friend, that's, if it would hurt me, and if I put myself in the other person's shoes, then that's how I decided it was wrong. Four hours after our interview, Kate was killed. Shot dead along an old railroad track, we should do good and then we will be rewarded, but I don't believe in punishment. That doesn't answer the questions. In fact, it just raises more questions, like this fog around us. It's, you know, I don't think any of us really see clearly in all of this uh, to, enough to be able to declare where it is we're going, but it seems as if where we've been is not where we're supposed to be.